and we are going live. Good evening viewers, I am Malavika Vinayar, a coordinator at EML and I take great pleasure in welcoming you all to the next lecture in EML webinar series 2021-22. Extramural Lectures is the flagship lecture series of IIDM that conducts year-long lectures and interview with distinguished speakers from various domains, including media, sports, administration, literature, politics, among others. In the past, we have proudly hosted the lives of His Holiness Dalai Lama, Vengaya Naidu, Kailar Satyarthi, Indra Nui, A.R. Rahman, to name a few. To add to this grand legacy, today we have with us Dr. Murali Tumarigudi as a speaker for this lecture. Dr. Murali is an internationally renowned expert in disaster response, having been involved in post-disaster response and follow-up of almost all the disasters of the 21st century, including the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, Cyclone Nergis in Myanmar in 2008, and the Thailand floods of 2011. He was the Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction in the United Nations Environment Program in Geneva and has recently been appointed as the Director of the Coordination Office of the G20 Global Initiative on Environmental Protection. He is also an alumnus of IIT Kanpur, where he completed his Master's and PhD in Engineering. Also a renowned author in Malayalam, Dr. Murali has published several books and is the recipient of the 2016 Kerala Sahitya Academy Award for Humorous Literature. So we are truly honored to have you today with us. Over to you. Thank you, Malavika, for the kind introduction. Good evening to those in India who is listening to this lecture, and also good day to those who are elsewhere. I am speaking to you today from Geneva. I'm actually, yesterday was my last day at the UN Environment Program, and uh, I'm traveling to born Germany tomorrow to take up the new assignment with the UN Convention on Combating the Certification. So it's truly a moment of reflection for me as well as to the changing landscape of disaster management. As Malavika mentioned, I have been involved in the disaster management and conflict management of almost all conflicts and disasters of the 21st century, starting from the 2000, Afghan you know, Iraq, the second Gulf War in 2003, um, situation in Gaza in 2005, situation in Lebanon in 2006. You know, so concurrent with the entire set of disasters which happened from tsunami to earthquake, uh, to volcanoes, I have also been involved in conflict management, but the environmental element of it. And all this happens in the backdrop of a changing climate. And this is the main point I want to reflect on today. Over the last 20 years, as I was involved in disasters and conflict, did climate change leave a footprint on this? Is there a climate fingerprint on some of these disasters? Are the number of disasters on the rise? I'm sure as I'm talking to a group of young scientists and engineers in IIT, I do not have to explain whether the climate is changing or not. I know there are people who still believe in that type of thing. And there'll always be some microscopic minority of people, but I know I do not at all um, discuss that anymore because the evidence of climate change is all around us. The hottest years around, storms are getting strong, stronger and more frequent, forest fires, unprecedented levels, droughts longer, flash floods everywhere. So there are many, many, many uh, very evident signs. In addition to the actual measurement of temperature, um, on land as well as sea. <clears throat> but the question is, are they leading to more extreme events? So the first question which I'll address, do we actually have more disasters now than let's say 20 years back? And the evidence is yes, absolutely. We have more disasters now than ever. But is it just because of climate change? Or is there any increase due to climate change? 
So this actually have two elements. We now have more disasters, not just because of climate change. We have more disasters simply because there are more people on the planet and people are now staying in areas which were once not habited. So if, I'll to give one example of Chennai floods. In 2015, there's a massive flood in Chennai. And I think there was an equivalent massive flood in 1918. And a lot more people were affected in the 2015 flood. And the reason was that Chennai of 1918 and Chennai of 20, 2015 are very different places. If you look at satellite image, Chennai of 2015 is even different from Chennai of 2005 or 1995 or 1985. Places which are not habited in 1985 or 95 became very populated areas. And some of these places were incidentally areas which are water storage areas. I think they are called tanks in Chennai. And they used to buffer the floods. So when those areas of buffering got converted into housing areas, IT parks, engineering colleges, industrial areas, suddenly the water had nowhere to go. So even if the same equivalent rainfall of 1918 had happened, it would have affected three times as many people, simply because there are more people and they're living in more vulnerable areas. And this is true across the world. This is something which we have to keep in mind, that there are more people and they're living in more and more vulnerable areas. The second thing is that we are now much better off economically than 100 years back. Kerala had a flood in 2018, one of the biggest in recent memory. But Kerala also had a massive flood in 1923. But the Kerala of 19, 2018 is a much different place than Kerala of 1923. Let's say the same area were affected, which in, indeed was the case. And what was the wealth of the people at that time? L let's take motor cars, for example. If you assume that 10% of all the motor cars were affected, in 1923, probably one car would have been affected. But if 10% of all motor cars were affected in 2018, that would be a million cars. And this is what happens when societies become prosper. And this also we see. So both in terms of human cost, as well as cost of human properties, disaster footprint is enlarging over the period of time. But on the top of this, we have the changing climate. As I mentioned, the climate is changing, the evidence is all over the place. At the United Nations, we deal with a number of disasters every year. But increasingly, we are spending more and more time dealing with what we call hydroclimatic disasters, as against geological disasters or technological disasters. Geological disasters are things like volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. And technological disasters are such as oil spills or nuclear incidents. The number of chemical factory accidents, number of nuclear incidents, number of oil spills, both on land and sea, they're all coming down because there are increasingly better systems in place. Geological disasters, on the other hand, are more or less constant because they work on a geological time. A tsunami happens between 1,000 years. Uh, earthquake happens you know, between, let's say, 80 to 100 years. And they do not change neither based upon the increase in human population or any other signal which humans have any control over. So those, the geological disasters are more or less stable. But 
Hydroclimatic disasters, on the other hand, are clearly exacerbated by climate change. And this we can see across the world. One of the most evident thing about climate change, and this has been known for at least 10, 15 years unequivocally, meaning people are not disputing it. Even if the total amount of rainfall is not increasing, the intensity of rainfall is increasing. So that means more rain is falling in less time. Now, our urban areas are not designed to deal with the increasing precipitation, which is happening in shorter duration. And this is causing two major urban floods across the world. And this is happening in Chennai, this is happening in Kerala, this is happening in Delhi, this is happening you know, in Thailand, it's happening everywhere, New York. This is something which we should worry about. Our overall concept of design of cities has to take a note of the fact that more rain is falling in less time. Now, this of course gets more complicated for places like Chennai or Singapore or Dubai, where which are coastal cities. And two-thirds of world's major cities are coastal cities, where as much as the flooding is increasing on the land, the sea level is also rising. And when sea level rise, what happens is that the, the water cannot go and empty into the sea. So there's a pushback from the sea and the water will not go down. And this is what happened in 2010 in Thailand when I was there. The mass, massive flood, the and Thailand is a coastal city. It's actually defended by a set of dikes around the city. As the urban areas, as the upstream areas got flooded and the dams started to fill up, the government decided to release the water in the dam. But Bangkok also had to be protected. So they did not open the dikes to let the water go down into the river. So that what happened was that the area between Bangkok and up in the hills they got flooded and for extended period of time. And this also happened, you know, this also influenced the floods which ha happened in Chennai and in Kerala because, you know, when you have sea level rise associated with flooding, flooding water, it exacerbates. And this is going to make it worse. The new assessment report from IPCC clearly says that the 100 year floods would be more frequent and maybe come in every 40 years. And 40 year, and 50 year floods will come more likely like in 20 years. And you are already noticing this all around. I'm, I'm referring to Chennai because it's a city which you are, many of you are familiar with and something which you have to deal with. But I must once again say that, you know, flooding did not start in Chennai due to climate change. I was in, my brother was a student at IIT Chennai in 1984. And the first time I went to meet him, that was also the week they had a massive flood in Velacheri, which is the, the village next to you. But Velacheri now is much more populated than Velacheri then. So when you have bigger floods, you have a lot more people affected. So what do we do in a situation like this, where you have a, an increasing population, B, an increasingly rich population, and C, climate change is adding on the top of the existing disasters or magnifying them. What do we do in such a situation? And this, is, this has been the focus of my work at the United Nations for many years. And I'll, because of short, shortage of time, I'll say a few things and I will stop. I understand there have been some questions. Uh, there's, uh, um, there's a request to reflect on some of my own personal experiences, which I'll come to. The first one is that in the United Nations, we believe that there are no 
natural disasters. We often use that. Out of habit, I may even use it. But theoretically, there are no natural disasters. Nature does not cause disasters. Nature has its phenomena. Rain is a phenomena. Earthquake is a phenomena. Volcano is a phenomenon. It is when we build our buildings, life, livelihood, without understanding this phenomena, that this natural phenomena become a disaster. So if you have a coastline, which is vulnerable to tsunami, and if you then build your houses there, clearly, when the tsunami comes, the house will be damaged, and there'll be disaster. Now, that's not because of the tsunami, that's because you placed your house at the wrong place. Japan, which has probably the longest experience dealing with tsunami, and the word tsunami itself come from Japan, they had a very simple way of letting people know how to prevent disasters. Every time a tsunami happened, the elders in the community went and put a stone at the last point till which the water, the seawater came inland. They are called a tsunami stone. So if a tsunami stone is placed between that point and the sea, you shall not build your house. If you build that house, the tsunami could come again. This is a hypothesis. It's very simple. Now, tsunamis don't come very often. Some tsunamis repeat every 500 years, some every 1,000 years. So over a period of time, people will forget. And that's why they put the stone. Because social memory is very small. About 30 years is what social memory will stay. But this type of footprint in the, on the land can stay longer. In fact, when I went to Japan in 2011 after the big tsunami, I actually went to a tsunami temple. Tsunami shrine is what temple is called in Japan. And as you know, if you make, convert something into a shrine, the chances that it will survive is longer. So it was actually five kilometers from the sea, and people then could no longer believe that a tsunami could have come, come five kilometers inland. So slowly by slowly, they assumed that the shrine is just a shrine, even though the anecdotal story was that the tsunami actually came till that. And people started building between that shrine and the coastline. And indeed, when the 2011 tsunami came, it came to 2.5 kilometers inland and killed 23,000 people, the biggest damage of people in Japan after the Second World War. So first one is to identify that there are possibilities of this. And then what do you do? For example, if you take earthquake, we know which cities in the world are vulnerable to earthquake. Delhi is one of them. Kathmandu is another. Istanbul, Jerusalem, San Francisco, Tokyo. These are very well, you know, well known. There are you know Himalayan areas, Pacific Rim. So there are many many areas, Ring of Fire, where we know from history there is volcanic activity and it will come. Now we also say that earthquake don't kill people, buildings do. So it's about you cannot move the city of Delhi or city of Tokyo away from where they are, but you can build differently. So if you have the same magnitude earthquake happening in Japan and in another place, in Japan, the buildings will stay because the buildings have been designed for dealing with the earthquake, which is not the case for building in many other places. I was in Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake. I think it's January 10th was the earthquake. I was there a couple of days after. The earthquake, I recall, lasted 36 seconds. It had 7.2 on the moment scale, and it killed 216,000 people, 216,000 people of, of a total population of 10 million. A month later, there was a tsunami in Chile, which had magnitude, if I recall, 8.6 or something like that. And in the earthquake scale, which means it's about a 500 times stronger than the Haiti earthquake. And the number of people died was less than 400 because Chile had designed their buildings differently. 
So that's the second point. So one is to prevent exposure. Second one is to plan your buildings different. And the third one is to understand what the changing climate is going to do. And I will stop with explaining that, not because there are not more to say, but because I wanted to give, I want to give more time for Q and A. We all know that hey, the climate is changing, and as I mentioned, one of the impact is going, there will be more flash floods across. So our cities will have to be redesigned. But one of the most important tasks on hand is to see our vulnerability along our coastlines. We already now know that the sea level is going to rise. And once you know sea level is going to rise and how much, then it's a, from a topographical point of view, it's a completely trivial task to map out which areas would be affected. And it, in fact, it has been mapped out. So if you go to a website called Climate Central, and you can take any part of the world, coastline, and see, will it be affected by 2050, 2070, or 2100? And many people imagine 2050 is far in future. They're not. 2050 will come, on, come to you like that. And 2070 will come. 2100 will come for sure. So you cannot start to do things imagining that's far later in time and technology would have solved it, et cetera, et cetera. You can't. So if you go to Climate Central website, you clearly see that these areas in the coast lane are going to be affected. Now, what do you do? People are there already. But the first thing you can do is at least not to put any new infrastructure in those areas which have been predicted to flood by 2050 or 2100. If you have to build your latest airport on the coastline, which is now fine, but will be flooded in 30 years time, and an airport's life, you know, your design life will take much longer than that, then you are clearly setting yourself up for trouble financially as well as convenience-wise, strategically as well. If you are building your railway, if you are building your highway, please look into it. If you are a private citizen and if you are buying an apartment in Chennai, in Kochi, in Kodikot, in Mumbai, in Calcutta, go and check Climate Change Web, Climate Central website and see is this area going to be flooded. Number two, what about people who are already there? Our fishermen, millions of them are living on the coastline. What do we do? To, for them. The first one to do is to explain to them that climate change is real and the coastline would be affected. And give them incentives to move. Don't you know, ask them to forcefully move, but give them incentives to move. When they have an opportunity, then they can move. And don't allow more people to come and stay. That means slowly by slowly, you can thin the coastline, reduce the population density, and eventually, when the climate change comes, the number of people who actually will have to be relocated become a much smaller number. So there are many ways in which we can deal with this. But if you don't do this, and this is where the climate security element comes in, if you don't do disaster risk reduction, this will lead to bigger disasters more people affected, more properties affected, and will lead to what we call climate refugees. And when you have climate refugees, nationally or internationally, that creates a problem. Already in India, you, you see this massive amount of migrant labor. In Chennai, in Kerala, in Punjab, in many states, you can see internal migrants. In Kerala, we did a study as to where are these people migrating from. And we could map 150 districts around the country, which are climate affected, climate vulnerable, and where the maximum number of migrants come. So it's not an accident that maximum number of migrants are from these 150 districts, which are also 
cost effect. Now, within a country, that's fine. But then massive amount of migrations that happen between countries that lead to conflict situations. It's not necessarily that conflict happened because of climate change, but the existing risk get magnified, stretched, because there is a resource competition that lead to conflict. And that's an entirely new area which the world is now worried about. I would stop now and I will see if there are, uh, there are questions from the moderator and to the audience and we can take it forward. Thank you. Sure, so that was really informative. Thank you for that. So now we'll move on to the questions. So uh, as you said, you have been part of uh, disaster management projects all over the world. So of all the uh, management uh, disaster reduction projects that you have been a part of, which one did you find the most challenging and why? And also in retrospect, uh, do you think the situation could have been handled better if something was done differently? Thank you. I you know, partly alluded to my experience in Haiti. Uh, Haiti, as you know, is a island uh, of the Americas. And um, the Haiti island is part of a Hispaniola island, which is divided into two countries, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And the earthquake happened in Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of the city. We, UNEP, had an office there, and UN had a much bigger office there, including a peacekeeping operation. And our own head office collapsed, killing our head of the office, number one, number two, and number three, plus 98 other UN colleagues died, along with 216,000 other people. And I was, I think, in Muscat at that time. And we know we have a global system of call out that when a disaster like this happened, we immediately get an alert. Then we express our willingness to go, and then we travel. I was in Haiti within a few days of arriving. I entered a city which probably devastated. Most or many, many, many buildings collapsed. No place to stay. Our offices had already collapsed. So we basically had to and of course, there was you know, security concerns as well. You know, when you have such a mass earthquake, we have um, security concerns as well. So we were staying within the UN compound, and the base, the facilities were absolutely minimum in, in, in a way that you know, basically there was no place to sleep. For example, so, you know, the community whose buildings were damaged, of course, they were sleeping outside. We were slightly better off inside the camp. I was sleeping in the car and there are three of us in the in the car sleeping you know and then our offices had also collapsed so that we were sitting under a tree and that was our office and we had to then go and deal with the challenges which included for example you know, thousands of dead bodies um, you know when you have 216,000 people dying suddenly in a city. You know, the, all, the, all the church cemeteries become full overnight and that body still will have to be dealt with. When you have a million, I think there are three million people who became homeless overnight, which means that you have to provide them shelters but then it, you have to also provide them with water and toilet facilities. And being an island, everything has to be brought in from other places. So things cannot be brought by ship because then it will take a long time. So everything has to fly in. The airport is not big for them to fly in. So it had to be brought to neighboring countries. So it was one of the biggest challenges which I have dealt with in my own career. Whether something could have been done better, you know, there are of course at two levels we are talking about one about our own work, and the other one is about could the country have prepared better. Now, this is the biggest challenge of our work. 
I work in two domains. One is called disaster response. The other is called disaster risk reduction. In disaster response, we always have enough resources available to us. The world community is very generous. When you have a crisis like this, there's always food, there's always tent, always shelter, always water. The world really gives out because everyone, any part of the world at some point of time has been victims. So they know the pain of being a victim of a major disaster. So the world gives. Uh, so the, our job clearly is to then connect the generosity of the world with those who are needy. This is really what we are. But their money is not the main issue. But the challenge is before, if we know there is going to be a flood in this area, an earthquake in this area, and if we want to make changes to building codes, the land use plan, we want to ask people to move from A to B, this is a very difficult task. Hardly resources come into that area because all of us assume that disasters don't somehow will not happen to us. Disasters is something which will happen to other people or some other place. You know, cyclones is something which will happen in, you know, Bay of Bengal, something which you are heard of in, you know, happening in Bangladesh or Orissa, but not in this part. And this is what we would like to believe. Now, this is not easy to change because it is so con convenient to leave the status quo. For example, I, I mentioned about the changing climate and the need to thin our coastline. Any government trying to go to the community in the coastline and say, climate is going to change, you people will have to move, it would be a very unpopular government. And you know, within a democratic context, mostly the government would be very uncomfortable trying to put any type of pressure on the people, even though it's for their own good. So we need better way of communicating to our people the challenges which are coming. Now, there's one thing the tsunami, uh, with the COVID has taught us is that when people know that there's an existen existential crisis, people are willing to change. People are willing to accept extreme controls on their life. Don't get out of your house. Who would have imagined that if two years, three years back, somebody came and said that if, something happened and the government will ask everyone to stay home, people will stay home and you would have said, no, no, that wouldn't happen in India. You know, we are a democratic place. So that wouldn't happen in Europe. You know, even when COVID restrictions came in China in January, people in other parts of the world were saying, oh, that China can do, but not us. But then we know that all parts of the world enforce this thing and people were willing to accept. So we now have a better hope that if we can communicate the existential crisis better, people will react better to that situation. So uh, adding on to that, uh, people's participation is vital for any disaster response project. You did mention about uh, communicating the existential crisis. But then uh, what can we do more to ensure and en enhance this public participation when it comes to disaster response? Thank you. The most important thing is to start our concept of safety when people are very young. So in, in the Western world, on the first day of school, the first hour, children are told that you are in a school environment, which is different from your home environment in two ways. Number one, you don't know the school very well, and there are many things in the school, unlike your home. There's a laboratory in the school, for example. There's a playground in the school. There are vehicles coming in and out, for example. So there are many things in the school, and there may be construction going on in the school. There may be multiple floors in the school, which may not be the case for all children from their house. Also, there is no, the degree of supervision at home is very different from the degree of supervision in the school. At home, you have brother, sister, parents, all watching you. But school, there's nobody watching you alone. They're all watching collectively. So because of these two reasons, you are slightly more vulnerable. So children are taught what are the key issues here, how do you deal with that? If something happens, 
whom do you go to report? And then as children grow, they have taught about first aid and basic life support and so on and so forth. And once you train with that culture of safety, then people start to behave in a safe manner. And that to such a society, it's much easier to communicate issues of disaster. But if we are grown with no sense of safety and a sense of belief that disaster is something which happened to other people, then you have a problem. You know, in my home state of Kerala, I write regularly about engineering college students drowning during their tour, you know, college tour, industrial visit, or whatever we, we call that. My own classmate, 1983, died drowning. Of course, we instituted a award in his name, etc. But we did not learn anything from that. Yesterday, day before yesterday, three students from one engineering college went to Udupi, died drowning. Just eight minutes. Every year it happens. Every year, probably in Kerala alone, 1,800 people up to die drowning. Half of them are young boys. Young meaning of schooling, college age. But still, we assume that this won't happen to us and still we take risks. So, unless we communicate to them young and capture their imagination and say this can happen to anybody, then it Try to build safety awareness when you are 25, that I think is going to be difficult. And this is why countries like Japan, you know, do much better in preparedness. Thank you. So yeah, things have to be communicated at a young age. Also now, given that you are injected into the curriculum revision panel of Kerala State, you know, Changes would be there in the curriculum itself, the school curriculum between from there. Uh, so moving on, uh, how do you rate India's disaster preparedness vis-a-vis other countries of the world? And uh, how can we improve our situation? Thank you. In India, as you know, is a huge country. It's almost like a continent. And every year, some part of India or the other will have a disaster, small or big. And we have all type of disasters. You know, we have, you know, glacial lake outburst in the Himalayas. And we have forest fires in Kerala. We have floods in Chennai. We have cyclones in Orissa. So, have, so we have lots of disasters, which also mean that we have lots of experience in dealing with them. Especially after 2004 tsunami, India came out with a robust National Disaster Management Act, and there's a National Disaster Management Authority, there's a National Institute of Disaster Management, and the State Disaster Management Authority, State Disaster Management Institute, and there's something which only India has to the degree that I know, it's called National Disaster Response Force, which is a set of trained paramilitary, such as CRPF and CASF, but only to be deployed during disasters. And I think there are 11 battalion of 1,000 people. One of them is in Arkonam near Chennai. And they have specialized equipment and specialized training. And no other country in the world to the degree that I know have it. And I remember in 2011, tsunami in Japan, the India's NDRF was actually deployed to Japan. Even though Japan have all the other setup, such a dedicated force was not there. So to that degree, we have many good examples at all. I think where we are not doing very good is in urban planning and building code management. So the sustainable way of reducing disaster is to have better land use planning so that cities do not grow into an areas which are potentially vulnerable, that people do not stay on the side of lakes and rivers and, and coastline, so that when water come and expand, you don't flood the houses. Now, if you look at Delhi, for example, our national capital, 
many of our infrastructure, including government infrastructure, such as you know, bus terminals, stadiums, they're all built in floodplains. And this is no different for other cities as well. Now, in the changing climate, we have to have a relook at our urban planning. And this is a challenging area, but something which we should do. It's the same about building codes, that our building codes, even though reasonably calibrated to various geographical areas, but not clearly in, in the same state, for example, in Tamil Nadu or Kerala, where there are coastlines and midlands and highlands, we could build the same type of land using the same type of buildings in the same type of material in the high range as well as in Kutanad, which is a, an area below sea level. And that's causing further problems. So that these are two areas where I think India can do better. So now we have a question from the audience. Martin Arikal has asked, uh, did you always want to work with the UN? And what is the biggest perk of working at such an organization? Thank you. Um, a good question. Uh, did I always wanted to work for the UN? No, certainly not. And I grew up in a very remote village uh, in Kerala. And you know, the biggest person I have seen in my childhood was a village officer or a, a panchayat secretary. And you know, if I could ever work, I didn't expect to become a village officer because you know they were too high for me. I grew up in a farming family. So if I could even become a village officer, that was even beyond me at that time. So my dreams were calibrated to the situation. And of course, as you, as I grew, I did engineering. I thought, oh, if I get a, into the Kerala PWD, it's the biggest thing. And then I you know, go to IIT, then you know, the dreams get bigger. But it's only when I started working internationally, I used to work for Shell. And that's when you started assuming that you could at least apply for the UN. Everyone, of course, it's a dream for everyone. And this is one message I want to leave with you, that as much as I could work for the UN, you can also work for the UN, and you should already start to plan, you know, either an internship or a volunteership or a consultancy, because UN is more than 50 separate organizations. And so regardless of your background, you are a civil engineer, a computer engineer, a mathematician, social studies, English literature, you have an opportunity in the UN. So you should continuously see, seek out for it. Of course, there are 192 other, 93 other countries who are also young people are still looking for that, but you at least have a chance. There's no discrimination there. So please continue to apply. So yes, so my dreams are calibrated as I grew rather than having a dream from childhood to work for the UN. What's the biggest perk for working for the UN? Of course, uh, you know, at a, at a very individual level, if you look at the level of respect you command, you can go present your visiting at any part of the world. You know, it is recognized and respected. That's at a very personal level, that's very good. But what really motivate me is that the type of changes we can make in situations where a country is just starting up or a disaster just happened, being at the right place at the right time, we can do a lot more with a lot less, just being there. I'll just give you one example. I was in South Sudan in a city called Rumbek, almost on the day when the, city, the country was conceptually born because South Sudan and North Sudan were in political and military conflict for over four decades. And they had just signed the comprehensive peace agreement. And I was there on day one, and which is almost the day you know, where, this, where the countries start to recover from the conflict and so on. And then we started to work there, you know, starting with helping with writing the constitution, to building institutions, to establishing institutions, implementing projects, and so on and so forth. Now, so you probably go with a small amount of money, maybe a million dollar. But at that point of time, you can make a huge difference. This is not the same if you go to a country which is well established and say you go with $10 million, you will not be able to make that much of a difference because the country is already established. So being on the ground for people at the biggest hour of their need, I think this is what really fascinates me. Thank you. That is indeed inspiring, sir.
Uh, also, now that you have uh, newly been appointed as the director of the G20 Global Initiative Project, uh, do you have any long-term initiatives in mind to tackle land degradation based on your capacity as the head of such a grand project? Thank you. As I mentioned, I am just taking up that position in two days' time. Land degradation is one of those you know, big issues um, which the world has to deal with. It is estimated that there are 2 billion hectares of degraded land, one way or the other, deforested due to agriculture, due to other recent desertification coming in. And the G20 ambition is to restore at least half of that, is a 1 billion hectare of land, which is almost equivalent, I think, of a country as big as China, for example, that, that big of. So the ambition is really massive. Now, how do we do this? You, know, you don't actually go and do this. What you have to do is to incentivize conservation as against destruction. And this can be done in many ways. Disaster risk reduction is one example that if we were to use nature as a way of defending against disasters, if you were to build co coastal mangrove belt, as a way of preventing coastal floods as well as tsunamis. So if you have to restore deforested mountain with forest and the right type of forest, it prevents landslides. If you have to have more wetlands around cities to act as buffer in China, they are called the sponge cities, they prevent disasters. So if you look that as a, not restoration as a primary objective, but disaster risk reduction, it's likely, more likely that people will do it. The same go for climate change mitigation. Planting more trees certainly act as a carbon sink for a while. So if you ha have many carbon offsetting plants, but you direct maximum amount of resources to this, and then using that planting trees as a way of restoring land, then you are also achieving scale. So there are many ways in which you can incentivize land restoration and achieve scale and eventually achieve the overall objective of land restoration rather than going and doing restoration for the sake of restoration. Sure, sir, thank you. So before we wind up, uh, do you have anything else to say to our audience? No, I can, first of all, I can say thank you for inviting me to this session. It is always a pleasure um, to talk to young people. I come to IIT very regularly, IIT Chennai actually. I have my friends teaching there. So it's a campus which I have known since 1984. And um, sadly, I'll be there again during, co of course, COVID time. I could not come for the last two years. There are no students either, uh, but I'll be back. But I want to tell you, the young students, that, you know, of course, you know, India has now a, a brand value and recognition, which is much better and different than the times when I was graduating in 1986. So, leverage on it, you know, go conquer the world, and uh, the world is waiting and ready for you to now come up and explore. Thank you. Sure, sir. We are sure try our level. So with that, we come to the end of today's lecture. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Murali for spending his valuable time with us, giving us insights and answering our questions. I'd also like to thank all our viewers who have joined us virtually for the lecture. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.